Anything specifically in Islam that you've seen that is oppressing women? No, I think it's so a lot of it is probably media, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, it's true. Cause a lot of people that I talked to said, you know, I want you to clear the picture. I want you to show that my society isn't the way you see it. And actually, I've never been somewhere where people were so incredibly generous and kind. Mm. And a lot of people told me that that's because it's built into the religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The spirit of hospitality and generosity. Mm. And we have a concept that look. If I do an act of charity or act of kindness or feed you food, it's not going to decrease my wealth. In fact, I'm going to get rewarded. Yeah, if you if you distribute food, food. yeah, 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 and yeah. that really can prove because every single house uh, I visited, you know, people were giving me dates and Saudi coffee and. Mm. And I actually, I, I felt very safe there. As a woman, I felt very safe. Mm. Compared to a lot of places in London where you can walk about and people will cat call you and people, you know, will follow you and mm. things like that. I thought it was, for me, it was a eye -opener. You're sending me mixed messages, madam. One minute you're saying women are um, suppressed. No, and then I you're like, from your experience, you haven't really noticed that. I, I think for me, I didn't. I didn't feel like women were suppressor, but I do think in the past... Example. Because I think you're an educated woman. I'll be interested to hear your insight, your, the nuanced answer you give. Because I think what ends up happening is sometimes we kind of superimpose what the media is saying, the narrative that's been fed to us, and we haven't actually critically looked into it and actually thought that way. Um, no, I, why I is Islam the fastest growing religion in Europe and in I America? Wouldn't, I wouldn't say that the reason why women were perhaps more oppressed there in the past, I really wouldn't say it was to do with religion. I think it was just to do with society. I think some people could even say that women not being allowed to um, to drive and things like that was a form of protecting women. Because that came out. Give, give me another of example women. apart from driving. Um, Even from the past, because I'm, I'm curious. I want to really kind of unpack that, if I, think I can. From the past, um, not being allowed to study at university, or, or not being able to uh, leave the country without a male guardian, things like that in the past. Mm. In regards to studying, I think basically the Islamic position is women, the responsibility to kind of work isn't, the burden is on women. And if yes. women want to study and men want to study, the criteria is for both of them to actually do it in a, in a kind of segregated, safe environment yeah, where there isn't that's free true. mixing. So and I don't think they ever said women can't study. Yeah. I think they've got a lot of facilities where women can study in yeah, a place. Yeah, it was just in a different way. Yeah. And, it's no and I think even research shows that women, men and women learn better and work better when it's, when it's separated. Um, separated. Yeah. Do you agree with, as, as, as no, an academic? I think, uh, yeah, I, th I mean, yeah. I went to an old girls' school many years ago, so yeah, I agree. And to be honest, every single woman that I spoke to, nobody said, oh, I feel repressed, you know. Mm. I really, I found the women uh, incredibly inspiring and mm. interesting and mm. creative. Mm. And even in regards to travelling, I think, I like mean, fundamentally, it's all now as well. I'm going to be honest with you. I think I'm not going to hide away from the fact that Islam teaches that um, there's a responsibility of the male members of the family, the men, um, to actually protect women, yeah. their family, yeah. not women, like their daughters, their sisters, their mothers. And as a general principle, like I have family members who welcome. Um, to as being being accompanied to go travel, does that make yeah. sense? So, yeah, yeah, it's true. if you ask a hundred women, would you like to travel by yourself? It's quite scary to do that. Yeah. Exactly. And also, there's the, that kind of comparison, um, you know, to women being kind of like a parallel and you know protecting mm. protecting the magic of mm. the world. I think that's that's true. As well. mm. And honestly speaking, it's like, look, if you had the money. Would you not invest, not yourself, like generally speaking, like if, um, if you felt unsafe, wouldn't you invest in a bodyguard? And if you had a bodyguard, would you choose a male bodyguard or a female bodyguard? I'd probably choose the, the most physically intimidating. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and even like 
the extension of that, because again, I want to be academically honest, I don't want to hide away from what Islam teaches. It's like, look, when women get married, um, there's an the emphasis for them to actually um, consult the father. And I actually had this conversation with my two boys, and I have a daughter. And I said that, look, when I pass away, yeah, if I, not if, like when, if, like I would want you as my children to take responsibility for my daughter, yeah, your sister, make sure that she, she is, makes the right choices when she gets married. Exactly. And these are boys who are growing up and I'm like, look, I have to have that man-to-man -man conversation. Does that make sense? And now that's not even politically correct. Man-to-man, -man, uh, I don't know. So I'm like, no, so I'm going to, I had that conversation with my children and my boys and I'm like, and when I was saying it to them, it was reinforcing how important it is and how it makes sense. Like, Would each other, the children? <laughs> guess. Uh... 11 and 10. The boys are? The boys, yeah. What age is? is My daughter is two and a half. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. She's got a lot of time. She's got a lot of time. But the, the conversation is more for them. Yeah. And specifically my 11 year old, he's going to start secondary school. Yeah. So the yeah, conversation is more for him. Transition. It's a massive transition. Yeah. And it's like, I want him to be conscious that look, um, as you grow up, that there's more responsibility. And right now, um, he's going to be going, because we don't have the facility to send him to like an only boys school. Yeah. Does that make sense? So now he's in an environment where he's going to be noticing girls. Yeah. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so the responsibilities that come are with that. To so many terrible exactly. Terrible One of my favorite quotes um, was in regards to treating the internet like it's a loaded weapon. And I'm like, wow, that's so profound. It's true because uh, a lot of my conversations with. Um, women in Saudi Arabia, you know, these were women who, yeah, they were on TikTok, yeah, they were on Instagram, but they were able to say, I am making the right choice, I am not going down mm. a bad avenue. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's a picture, you know, people, whenever they think of women in Saudi Arabia, they think, oh, these are just women sitting in the world, I will know, these are incredibly empowered, enlightened women. Mm. It's, it's really and I'm not, I'm not even doing the topic justice, like, you know, we have female scholarship. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The wife of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha Radhanha, she was a scholar in her own right and people went to her for knowledge. Does that make sense? We don't we don't shy away from actually having women who have knowledge and actually acquire knowledge from people who are qualified. Yeah. Does that make sense? And when you look at this was fourteen hundred years ago, yeah. when you're having so debates yeah. about if women had souls and yeah, so it's just, it's just fascinating that there's still that perception about how uh, Muslim women are treated. And I do think, yeah, I do think, unfortunately, the media can be very inflammatory. Mm. You know, the, the media, whenever they go down, so I live in France. Okay. And in France... That's a whole new kind of world. <laughs> yeah, it's incredibly xenophobic. And, mm, mm, you know, mm, mm. even sometimes my husband will say things that really, really anger me. Mm. so incredibly culturally insensitive. He's French, I assume. Uh, yeah, he's yeah. French, and you mm -hmm. know, so he, he would he would look at a woman who's wearing a hijab and immediately, mm. immediately curse us, whereas I would mm. say, well, actually, no, mm. you know, this is her choice, this is why she's doing it. Mm. Like, whenever I was in Saudi Arabia, mm. I would wear a nubaya and a hijab. Because oh, did you? Okay. Well, yeah, because it was from a cultural respect, and... Mm. I didn't see that as something that was impressive. It was, it, I find it interesting. I was speaking to one of my French colleagues and he got a little bit heated. And she said that, look, um, in France, we are giving women's rights, Muslim women. And I go, thank you for giving Muslim women the right by taking away the right to choose what they're going to wear. I'm like, how does that make any sense? Um, and the fact of the matter is, you have to remember, especially in the West, Right? Like, you can't force someone to wear certain clothing. So, if they choose to wear a baya and loose garments in France, where the law isn't compelling you, and you can potentially take criminal charges, or you're, you're able to make an informed choice, quote unquote, informed choice, but then now you're taking away that choice. How does that make sense? Um, and it's interesting, how was your experience when you wore that baya? There's a story, I know somebody who actually, a non-Muslim woman in Europe, she was covered head to toe. And I bet her experience was completely different. Pardon? 
I bet her experience was completely No, no, and she didn't have a choice. So there was a Mus Somali woman, sister, who gave her salam, like greeted, greeted, greeted her. And she's like, oh, what's that? I'm not even Muslim. I said, well, you're covered head to go to the point that your eyes are covered and you're not even Muslim. She goes, yeah, like, I like being yeah, no, dressed no, like this, yeah. not, not being um, kind of catcalled. Yeah, and, actually, yeah. a lot of those. You know what I mean? Yeah, even and even, like, even. Maybe a lot of women were saying, you know, with this, I'm safe walking on the streets. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the fundamental reason I'm here is to theology. So, do you, would you class yourself as a theist or atheist or agnostic? or? Where you at? Probably agnostic. Agnostic. Okay. Can something come from nothing? Yeah. That's impossible. <laughs> and you can't give me a practical example of that. Because it's an it's a oxymoron. It doesn't make sense. Because it's like, how can something come from nothing? So I want to give me an example. Like, educate me. I could be wrong. Something come from nothing? You have nothing. And then something comes from, from nothing comes nothing. Well, yeah, or even from, from nothing can come something in terms of emotion, fear. No, 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 that, that's the mind. So that's the brain. I'm talking there's nothing and then from there comes something. I'm talking mainly matter and the universe. So there's nothing. Yeah, nothing can, nothing can. Come from nothing. nothing. Yeah. And like biologically in the sense that there's cause and effect, like um, chemicals are released in the brain and then you've got the emotions, like you see something and then it makes you emotional and it's releasing chemicals. Again, that's, that's a, you have the mind, you have the brain, you have the chemical neuron pathways. And stuff. I'm talking universe, there's absolutely nothing there. From that nothing, where did matter come from? Where did the universe come from? I'm saying from nothing comes nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So then the question arises, where did the universe come from? As a Muslim, I would argue, something that's outside of the universe, all-powerful, has intelligence and has will that created the universe. And the Qur'an gives a four-line definition of God, right? which says that, um, say Allah is uniquely one. He is self-sustaining, eternal. He doesn't have offspring, nor was he born. He wasn't created. Always there, does that make sense? Um, and there's nothing comparable, there's nothing equal to God. And I feel like that four line definition gives me an understanding of what created the universe, where the universe came from. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I, I don't see that as problematic or mm -hmm. any worse or, yeah. you know. So I would say that it's more logical and rational, based on this, it's more logical and rational to believe in a creator, a God, Allah, than not to believe in creator. I'm not even going into religion yet. No, I, I, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. Now, so I'm glad to say from agnostic, you've gone into theist. Well, I'm not sure, but... Uh, no, okay, to make you sure... Really soon. Pardon? I've got to go really soon. Really soon, okay. Um, very quickly, okay. I'm going to talk to you about the Quran, then I'm going to let you go. Okay. And in like two, one, one minute, one minute. Um, thank you. No, no, we're here every Fridays and Wednesdays. Um, there's people outside White Chapel Station, so you can continue this conversation. But um, just my kind of icing on the cake, my stamp on the envelope, my evidence is the preservation of the Quran. The preservation. The preservation. Yeah. That's true because it has not, it has not been changed like the Bible videos. That is true. Yeah. yeah. Plus, there's no contradictions in it. Yeah. There's no yeah. mistakes in it. And even, you know, even people who I talk to who are, say, very, very Christian, they will acknowledge that. would acknowledge that. that. And yeah. I'm saying Western academics acknowledge the fact that the Quran hasn't been changed. If you Google Quran, Birmingham manuscript, you see that um, Western academics are saying, look, they've got the oldest Quran and it's been preserved. It's been carbon dated to the time of the Prophet. That's my secondary evidence, by the way. My primary evidence is, um, over 200 million people have memorized the Quran word for word, letter for letter, for an oral tradition of memorization. So preservation is one thing. And the second thing is the message and the fact that when it talks about history, it gets it right. It has prophecies, everything's right. It talks about science, gets it right. I'm saying 
who would be able to talk about um, the layers of the sea from 1400 years ago, talk about the water cycle 1400 years ago, talk about embryos, talk about reflected light from the moon, talk about the fingerprint that we didn't know 1400 years ago and we know now. So, have you got the Quran, sorry, did you say? Can I give you a free Quran? Yeah, of course. I love how your face lit up. Oh, yeah. I'm I mean, this is the point of you know, being an anthropologist to read different things, to understand different yeah. cultures. No, no, I'm glad to hear it. Um, would you like, um, I feel like giving one to your partner. Did you say husband or partner? My husband. Your husband, the French man. Yeah, he doesn't, yeah. He wouldn't, he wouldn't read it. I wish. No, okay. I, will, I will read it. Thank you so much. I feel oh, like having the to be continued. So next time you're passing through, do you, do you live in France? Do you live here? Yeah, I come, but, but I come every month, so I'm always back. <laughs> Is it? In a month's time then, hopefully exactly. I'll see you again. That would be and I'll, I'll give you this as well. And then once you've read through that, I'm sorry, this just goes in regards to like reasonings for to believe in God and our concept of God goes through the names and attributes, God being all loving, all knowing, merciful, the most just. Like what does that mean? How do we connect with God through that booklet? And yeah, in a month's time, once you've read through it, um, it'll be interesting to see what you feel. Okay, so every every Wednesday... Wednesdays and Fridays. Wednesdays and Fridays. Yeah. Perfect, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam. Take care, bye. Alhamdulillah, that was a very good conversation. Um, I hope everyone who was watching this picked up on the fact that she started off talking about how Muslim women are oppressed and then couldn't really give any reasons, examples of this. And then when she was pressed a bit more, she's like, like the examples she gave, she actually agreed that, wait, it's not actually oppression. So I think sometimes when we think about things critically and we ponder upon these things, we actually fundamentally agree with what Islam is teaching. So I felt like that's a really good conversation. Uh, alhamdulillah, she was interested in reading the Quran as well. And I think this emphasizes the point of how Muslims our actions, our behavior is dawah. We need to be conscious of it as well and be mindful. So may Allah grant her hidayat and make her gaining knowledge and soften heart towards Islam and connect her with the Quran. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa